We're going to continue in Chemistry 131A, and today we're going to talk about hartree fock calculations, spin, and Slater determinants. We left off, uh, we had introduced Douglas Hartree, who devised a method to solve the Schrodinger equation for an atom. The starting point for the helium atom is to write the wave function for the two electron uh, system as a product of two one electron orbitals. That's the essential simplification. And as we've seen earlier when we went through this calculation before looking at it more generally, um, this is a somewhat flawed approach. We'll see exactly why it's flawed in, in a minute, but it's much better than nothing. And according to our uh, interpretation of probability density, the probability density of electron 2 then is just phi star r2 phi star r, uh, phi r2 dr2. That's the probability uh, density that you're going to be in that uh, region of space. And rather than attempting to solve the uh, equation in one go, we instead convert this um, second electron into just a classical charge distribution. That's the essence of the simplification. When we have the two electrons, where really they're both buzzing around, we have to keep track of both of them in some sense. And that means if our wave function has both of those coordinates in there, it's six-dimensional and it's very hard for us to understand exactly what it is. But if we uh, say, well, the, well, we'll average the second electron out into a blur and we'll assume we can ca calculate some time average property like the stable energy of the atom by first averaging it out to a charge distribution and then solving for the energy of the first electron in this charge distribution. To do that then, what we need to do is we need to figure out what the energy is, the average energy of interaction between the first electron and the charge distribution. But we can do that because um, we can calculate the effective potential uh, as a function of R1, the position of the first electron, by doing this integral. We can average phi star R2, 1 over R12, phi R2. And we can integrate that. And that's a function then that only depends on R1 because in the difference R2 minus R1, R2 is integrated out. So we get then an effective potential that only depends on where the first electron is. You can imagine the second electron is some blur. It gets less as you go farther away from the atom. And if the first electron is out on the fringe of the blur, it doesn't have very much repulsive um, potential energy pushing it away. If, on the other hand, it's at a position where the blur is uh, got a heavy density, then on, uh, it feels a lot of repulsive and it, the energy goes up and it may tend to try to avoid uh, that particular region. With this trick then of integrating out the second electron, we get a one-dimensional problem, which is just like all the other one-dimensional problems that we've done the hydrogen atom, the particle in a box. The main thing is that we've got something that depends just on the coordinates of one electron. That's the main simplification. Let's look at how we would implement this then for helium. We've solved helium and hydride, guessed various wave functions, tried the variational approach, perturbation theory, so on and so forth. Let's say we wanted to take this systematic approach this is going to be very good then for bigger atoms where we're never going to divine such a good guess as we may have been able to do for a two electron system. We can write in atomic units for helium then that the effective Hamiltonian, which depends only on the coordinate R1 here, 
is the kinetic energy of electron 1, that's minus 1 half del 1 squared, minus 2 over R1 because Z is 2, there's plus 2 charge for helium, plus this V effective uh, for electron 1 of R1, which has this um, interaction with the cloud of electron 2. That, that, that is it, and this looks very much like any other kind of uh, one-dimensional, uh, one-coordinate problem. It's a three-dimensional problem, of course, but in actual fact, since it's going to have um, uh, uh, sphere, it's only going to depend on R1 is the main thing, so it's not going to be a multi-dimensional uh, problem. The key is that the, the first electron sees only the average and not where the instantaneous position of the second electron is. And that, that's a key difference here. Well, what we get then is we get an equation that's very much like that for the hydrogen atom. We then have this effective Hamiltonian, which has the kinetic energy, the attraction to the nucleus, and the average repulsion with the second electron. That is our Hamiltonian. We put that on some wave function and we want to get an energy which I've called epsilon 1 times the wave function. So we want to find the eigenfunction for that Hamiltonian. But there's a catch. The first catch is that we've got to know the orbital phi 2 for the second electron before we can know the effective potential for the first electron and set up the effective Hamiltonian for the first electron and then solve for it. And we don't know the wave function for this, uh, the orbital for the second electron. The second catch is that the two orbitals are the same for the spatial part. And therefore, what it amounts to is that we have to know the first orbital to know the first orbital. That seems circular and it seems like we're going to be completely stuck because we need to know something to get what we need to know. But in fact, in a lot of things like that, um, you can solve things like that iteratively. You can guess something and then go round and round. And that's essentially the essence of the self-consistent field approach. We guess something reasonable, we calculate an effective potential, and then we iterate. So let's see how, how, how we would do this. We're going to um, guess something, we're going to calculate an effective potential, and we're going to put an index on our guess. We're going to guess some function. It could be just an exponential function with a parameter zeta. It could be anything we want. We're going to put that in, calculate the effective potential, and we're going to index that as our zeroth guess. Doesn't matter what we call it, but we want to keep track of that function. So we have a function, we put it in, we then use this to calculate the effective potential, then we got the Hamiltonian, and then we calculate this energy, epsilon 1, for the Hamiltonian, and we then also get an updated orbital, an improved orbital, which solves this equation based on the potential for the old orbital. This new orbital we're going to call phi 1 superscript 1. That's the first iterate. And then, using this improved orbital, phi 1 superscript 1, we're going to go back again calculate the effective potential which has now changed because phi 1 has changed and we're going to calculate the new repulsive term solve it again and go round and round and round and we calculate phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, we can keep going till the cows come home. When you do this kind of thing one of two things invariably happens. Either your guess was pretty good if your guess was pretty good, what's going to happen is that you're going to get a better and better and better answer each time you go around. And eventually what happens is that you find 
that the function, you can uh, take the difference between the nth function and the nth plus one function, you can take it, subtract them, square it, and integrate it, and when it doesn't change beyond a certain percentage that you set, you can tell the computer to knock it off and quit because you have a self-consistent solution in the sense that when you put in the orbital, calculate the effective potential, solve it, you get the same orbital. That doesn't mean it's right. In fact, it's not right, but it's self-consistent. And in a certain sense, it's the best you can do with this kind of approximation, this piecemeal breaking the stuff down one by one by one. And the nice thing about it is that it does generalize. In other words, if there's a whole bunch of electrons, you can average all the other ones out into some giant charge cloud. Then you can solve this one. Then you can average him into the rest and solve number two electron. And you could go boom, 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 boom for all n electrons, go through the whole thing one time. And now your new wave function is the product of all those things. And when the product of all those things doesn't change or not much, or the energy is not improving much each time you go around, it's not lowering, then you can quit. So you can have various stopping criteria. Either the wave function doesn't change too much, the energy doesn't improve, so maybe the wave function is changing but the energy is staying flat and you just get sick and tired of waiting around. Or the other thing can happen, which is if you make a very bad guess, then you may just go off to a worse wave function and that may make a worse density and that may make a worse potential and then you may get a bad one again and so forth. And you can, you can easily have that happen when you're looking for the roots of a polynomial if you happen to make a very bad guess and you get near a, a horizontal tangent and you're using Newton's method, you'll find out you, your next guess is way off 10 to the plus 10 and then you get lost out there whereas the real root is 3 or something. That can happen with any iterative method. It can become unstable. Um, that doesn't seem to be a big problem with this method with physical atoms and probably because there are very reasonable guesses you can make. So you start, if you start near the correct answer and you zoom in, then you, you um, just pound a nail right into the root. And so uh, since you've got some good orbitals to start with, or reasonable ones anyway, um, you probably don't have that kind of problem with this approach. Um, so this is an interesting approach, but the question is this, how do we know that the orbital that we get at the end, um, let's say for helium, is any good? And uh, the question is, is it any good? So it turns out that the variational principle helps tell us that what we get with this self-consistent field approach is extremely good. Um, if we calculate the expectation value of the energy in the orbital approximation, we get this equation for E that I've shown on slide 500. And um, our Hamiltonian for helium, I've broken up into two parts, or three parts, excuse me, the kinetic energy of the f and potential energy of the first electron, kinetic energy and potential energy of the second electron, and then the interelectron repulsion. And that breaks up into three terms because when we do the integral, if the variable only depends on electron one, then nothing happens to the wave function two, so we get the integral of phi star two phi two but we assume it's normalized, so that's 1, so it's just out of our hair. We get I1, which is the integral of the first electron coordinate, and we get I2, which is the integral of the second, and then we get this thing I've called J11, 
which is the integral of phi 1 star phi 2 star 1 over r12, and that's our repulsive term that we've seen before when we were setting up helium and hydride. And in fact, this integral is called the Coulomb integral because it looks exactly like two charge distributions repelling each other. If we write the energy then as E is equal to I1 plus I2 plus J11, then um, the exact Hartree-Fock equation results if we minimize the energy with respect to phi. And what that means is that the variational approach is telling us that if we want to find the best orbital in this product of orbitals approximation, then what we should solve is exactly the equations that Douglas Hartree suggested that we should look at. And that means that in the orbital approximation, this is going to be um, the best approach. We have to be careful, though, with the Hart-Trefock energies. And that's because these energies, when we solve, we solve for H1 phi 1 is equal to epsilon 1 uh, phi 1. And same for phi 2. In helium, they're the same. In other atoms, they would, they would be separate things depending on which electron we're looking at. If we um, add up those energies, those energy eigenvalues, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, we don't get the total energy of the helium atom. Because what we get is we get I1 plus J11, that's for epsilon 1. And then we get I2 plus J11 again for uh, um, epsilon 2. And that's not equal to the total energy because the total energy is I1 plus I2 plus J11. In fact, what you can show then is epsilon 1 is equal to the total energy of the atom minus I2. But I2, which you can go back to slide 502, is nothing more than the energy of a helium ion only calculated with the orbital solved for from the helium atom. Though that, what that means then is that epsilon 1 is an, in fact a direct approximation for the ionization energy of the helium atom. In other words, minus epsilon 1 is equal to the ionization energy of the helium atom. That's an approximation because it assumes that you can use this orbital that you solved for for the helium atom to, fig, uh, to figure out the energy of the helium ion just by, by taking the um, other electron away. What this is called is Koopman's approximation. And it, all it does is it assumes that we can use the same orbitals in the ion and the atom, which is not quite true. But the fact that it's even close at all indicates that the um, orbital approximation and the self-consistent field approach is reasonably good for a lot of atoms. Uh, now I want to talk about something called correlation. The price that we pay by dividing these things up and treating them one at a time is that if you treat things one at a time, then you can never have both of them interacting together because you're treating them one at a time. Whenever you're treating this electron, the other one's a blur. When you're treating this one, this one's a blur. And that's a flaw because, in fact, in the real thing, they are avoiding each other at all times. That means that they tend to do stuff like this and not stuff like that. And that's impossible to take into account because we don't let the other one exist. If we had a lot of electrons all at once in the atom, and they're all doing stuff, I think you can see it gets extremely complicated. The wave function is depending on all these variables. We don't know what it looks like. 
these electrons are avoiding each other all the time. We're never going to guess what the wave function is. And in fact, it would be very difficult to even have a systematic method uh, uh, of organizing our thought. So even the fact that when we build up the periodic table, we talk about electron configurations, 1s1, 1s2. We're talking about orbitals there. But if we don't actually have any orbitals, if the atom is actually far more complicated than that, then we're actually letting on. If it's just a giant wave function, then we've got problems even understanding how we're going to organize our thoughts. So the orbital approximation is incredibly important. But what we have to be able to do if we want to get the energy better is we have to take into account that there is some correlation, electron correlation, um, going on in these systems. In the Hartree uh, equations, the motion of the electrons is called uncorrelated because that's what it is. We just blur one out. We never asked what the other one was doing when we did that because it doesn't matter. We're treating them independently. So if they are correlated, we're getting rid of that. And therefore, the correlation energy is what we left out. And that is just the difference here. This equation, E correlation, is equal to the exact energy, whatever that is, could be measured by experiment or by some other kind of calculation that gets a better energy, minus the energy in the orbital approximation by doing the Hartree-Fock treatment. For helium, something simple like that, we know the exact energy uh, and we know the Hartree-Fock energy and the what we find out is the correlation energy for helium is the exact, which is minus 2.9037 um, in Hartree's, minus what we calculate from the Hartree-Fock limit minus 2.8617 Hartree's, or we get minus 0.042 Hartree. And unfortunately, the energy in Hartree's in atomic units is a huge unit of energy. And so when we convert this into units that are more um, familiar to chemists, we get minus 110 kilojoules per mole. Um, that means that although the Hartree-Fock energy accounts for almost 99% of the exact energy, the error that we've got in doing this calculation is way too large because it's roughly um, the energy of a chemical bond. And what we're saying is if we have an approach like this, we can't tell if we've got a bond or, or we don't have a bond. We don't have a fine enough magnifying glass to be sure that we've got the energy down to where we can tell that something is there or not there. That's very bad. And that's because that gets worse, too, with bigger atoms. And the reason why it gets worse is that we have very, very big energies for the 1s and 2s and so forth orbitals, but um, they aren't playing much role in the chemistry. The chemistry has to do with the electrons that are in the outer orbitals that can make bonds and so forth and so on. So we have this huge um, thing with a lot of energy, and we've got this subtle thing that we're trying to look at. And we've, if we want to um, uh, take a submarine and then a submarine plus me, and tell the difference between that, we have to have a, a scale that has a lot of difference and that, uh, a lot of digits because the submarine's so darn heavy that we need to measure it way, way out there to tell whether I'm on the submarine or not. In percentage terms, we've got to get the mass of the submarine to 99.99999% accuracy. And that's the same problem that we've got here calculating these kinds of energies is that they get big and so the differences can be big even if we think our calculation is pretty accurate. 
is to summarize, this is a common problem and so-called chemical accuracy in doing any kinds of these computational studies is very hard to obtain. Usually what you try to do is have two systems that are very similar in a lot of ways and then you have one thing that's different and you're hoping to calculate the different thing and what you what you pray is that the things that are similar if you make mistakes or approximations or goofs of some kind they're about the same for both sides and so they just go out whether you got them right or wrong doesn't so much matter because you're making comparisons so rather than making some absolute thing saying the energy of this molecule is right here what you may be actually more interested in anyhow is how, how does it compare to this isomer or that or that configuration and you may be able to do a lot better on that because a lot of the things will be the same and therefore whether you calculate them accurately or not as long as you make the same kind of mistakes on both uh, of the sides it goes out. Now let's take spin into account because we haven't talked about that. We've been, we've been really glossing over the Pauli principle, namely that the wave function be anti-symmetric under the exchange of the two electrons. How are we going to take that into account? Well, um, we could, like our book does, we could use a superscript alpha. I probably won't stick with that because I, I don't care for that all the time or beta to indicate a wave function for an electron that's either spin up or spin down. And you can also write that as just a spatial part times a spin part. So you can think of the spatial part as the probability amplitude. You're going to square it to get the probability density. And you can think of the spin part as just a bar magnet riding along and you can think is it up or down? And that would be a quite simple picture of what's going on. And they have nothing to do with each other per se. In other words, the spin um, coordinates are just this up or down orientation of the magnet. And there is no function of space for that. That's something that originates from a point from the electron itself. And the alpha state, if we measured um, the spin orientation, that, well, by convention, the z component is h bar over 2, and for the beta state, the z component is minus h bar over 2, otherwise they're identical. Because there's only two values of the spin, we can represent the spin um, rather than having a function like a wave function where we, we have this density all over space, we can just write the spin as column vectors. And we can write, here I've written alpha, I've uh, said it can correspond to a column vector with a 1 in the top and a 0 in the bottom. And beta can be a column vector with 0 in the top and 1 in the bottom. And these 2 by 1 column vectors can then represent the state of the spin in these problems. When we want to um, integrate the spin, we have no dx to integrate over. Rather, what we do is we rearrange the column so it's like a row. Here I've written alpha star then is equal to 1 star, which is 1 because there's no imaginary part, 0 as a row. Beta star is equal to 0, 1 star, which is just 0, 1, as a row. Then when I want to um, take the um, product and figure out that I'm normalized, I just take the row times the column, like matrix multiplication. So I follow the entries, the row first entry in the row times the first entry in the column plus the second entry in the row times the second entry in the column. And if it's normalized, that should be 1. 
And if it's not normalized, it's something else. And if they're orthogonal, it should be zero. This can be written then in this notation, which is very common, which was introduced by Paul Dirac and is extremely useful, especially for spin, in that we, instead of um, having an integral of psi star psi dx or something like that, we have this angle bracket with a line in between, so-called inner product or braquette, and I've written out then what it would be for alpha alpha, it's 1, 0 times 1, 0, which is 1, times 1 plus 0 times 0, which is 1. Beta is just the other way. That comes out to be 1 as well. That means that our spin states, alpha and beta, written this way, are normalized. And then if I take the inner product with alpha on beta, I have 1, 0 times 0, 1, 1 times 0, that's 0. 0 times 1, that's 0, so that because they're in different positions in this 2 by 1 column, they're automatically orthogonal. Therefore, the spin part, if I write them like this, is automatically normalized and orthogonal. We can use an index then to keep track of which electron we're actually talking about. If we have alpha and then we have a parenthesis 1, what that is, it's a shorthand notation to say, look, spin, the electron we're calling 1 is spin up. The bar magnet's up on electron 1. Therefore, in the orbital approximation, we can write the shorthand wave function, psi, 1 comma 2, which just means the first electron, the second electron. This is quite abbreviated because we, we don't even have the R1. We get tired of even writing R. We just understand what we mean. 1s alpha 1, 1s alpha 2, uh, beta 2, for example. What does that mean? That means the spatial part of electron 1 is a 1s type orbital, e to the minus um, r. And the spin part is up for electron 1. And for the second electron, it's also in a 1s spatial orbital, same shape. And the spin is down. That's all it means. The electrons, however, are indistinguishable. All electrons are identical. And so we could equ equally well write psi uh, 2, 1 is equal to 1s alpha 2, 1s beta 1. E either one of these would be acceptable. And of course, when we've got both combinations, what you learn quickly in this game is that when you've got two choices in quantum mechanics, you always use both of them somehow. You don't choose one because there's no reason to choose one over the other. So you have to use both of them, and the question is then, what combination do you choose? Well, there's a symmetric combination, psi 1, 2 plus psi 2, 1, and that's 1s alpha 1, 1s beta 2, plus 1s alpha 2, 1s beta 1, and there's an anti-symmetric combination, um, psi 1, 2 minus psi 2, 1, 1s alpha 1, 1s beta 2, minus 1s alpha 2, 1s beta 1. Uh, the first combination is symmetric, the second is anti-symmetric, and neither one is normalized. Let's then, as practice problem 25, let's normalize them by just following through this little spin algebra exercise. Let's normalize the anti-symmetric orbital um, which I called psi sub a for anti-symmetric. So here's the answer. We can assume the spatial parts are normalized. The 1s part is normalized, and all we have to do is figure out the spin parts. Uh, therefore, what we have to do is figure out the inner products of these spin parts, and then make sure, after we include the spin parts, that the integral of psi star 
a psi a is equal to 1 when we integrate the whole thing up. Using a shorthand notation here, which gets a little bit long, the integral of psi a star a psi a is equal, well, I've got to write out those two terms, the anti-symmetric part time starred, while the 1s is real, the other part, and then this factorizes in this case. It does not always factorize, but in this case it does, into uh, alpha 1 beta 2 on alpha 1 beta 2 times the double integral of the space part, which we can assume is 1, minus, well, there's two terms, so we're going to get, you know, first inside, outside, last, minus alpha 1 beta 2 beta 1 alpha 2, minus beta 1 alpha 2 alpha 1 beta 2, plus beta 1 alpha 2 beta 1 alpha 2. And since the space parts just integrate to 1, I don't have to bother with that. I know that the 1s's are already normalized. And uh, then I end up with these four spin parts. And you can either write them out as 1 by 2 vectors uh, or 2 by 1 column and row. Or you can just say, look, if it's alpha 1 on alpha 1, if those are in a sandwich, that's 1. If it's alpha 1 on beta 1, then that means that um, it's zero because alpha and beta are orthogonal. And of course, the sandwich applies to the, el the electron because you, have, you, have, you don't take um, things that have different electrons and compare the spin parts because those are irrelevant. What you want to do when you're normalizing is compare the same part of the function. And if we do that, the first term's one, minus the second term 0, the third term minus is 0, the fourth term, not surprisingly, is plus 1, and so the whole thing is plus 2 with that. And we sort of did this before, but it's nice to do it again just to review. The integral is 2 rather than 1, so the normalization constant is just the square root of 2 over 2. You could write 1 over the square root of 2, but it's nicer to so-called rationalize the denominator. That means if you have a fraction, you don't have imaginary numbers in the denominator, and you don't have square roots and things like that in the denominator if you can avoid it. You keep them all in the numerator instead, where it's easier to see. So you want a rational number in the denominator. Not all books um, stick to that principle, however. The only um, wave function with the correct part to satisfy the poly principle is the anti-symmetric spin part. The symmetric one's no good. And therefore, our uh, wave function then should be root 2 over 2, 1s alpha 1, 1s beta 2, minus 1s alpha 2, 1s beta 1. Great. That's pretty easy to do for two electrons. The question is, what do we do if we've got three, four, five, a whole bunch of electrons? Um, and if we swap any two of them, not just the 2 and the 1s orbital or something like that, but if we swap any two, number 1 with 128, we swap what we're calling them in our equations, we swap the labels, then Pauli tells us that the wave function should change sign, the overall wave function. Um, that gets tricky then to think up what combinations you're going to use, and at that point, um, you, you really enjoy having a mathematician down the hall to help you figure out something that could be um, useful. And in fact, John Slater devised a very ingenious and very compact notation to solve this problem, which is now called the Slater determinant. Um, to show you how important it is, he got his name on the thing. Let's have a look. 
Recall, um, if, you, if you haven't had a course in linear algebra, you may need to review, but what's new? Throughout this course, I've been saying there are various techniques in mathematics that you need to be able to use, um, like you need to be able to use a wrench or a screwdriver if you're going to take something apart. And here we've got a two by two determinant. It's written like a matrix, but a matrix has brackets around it. A determinant has straight lines. And you have to look carefully sometimes at something to see what object it is. Because a determinant is just a number if it has numbers in the entries. And a matrix is not just a number. A matrix is a matrix with a whole bunch of dimensions to it. If we write then a two by two determinant, a one by one determinant is just the number. Nothing new there. Um, if we write a two by two determinant with A and B in the, in the top row and C and D in the bottom row, then you do a crisscross. You take AD minus BC. And of course, it doesn't matter whether you write it as CB or BC, but I'll keep the alphabet in order. That's the, that's the determinant of a two by two matrix. And if we swap the rows, so we put CD at the top and AB at the bottom, what we get is we get CB, when we do the crisscross, minus AD. And that is minus AD minus BC. And therefore, the determinant has this interesting property, at least for the two by two, that if we swap two rows, it automatically changes sign. This sounds very promising. Um, if the two rows are identical, they're both the same entries, then we get AB minus BA, we get zero. And that could be very useful too, because that could mean that if we could set these up as electron orbitals, that if they were all the same, then the wave function wouldn't exist. We wouldn't allow that wave function. And then if we label them um, as the rows, then if we swap any two rows, it changes sign automatically for us, and the rest is um, down to figuring out how to do it. Okay, on slide 515, I've written kind of an intimidating formula for a three by three determinant. The top row is ABC, the middle row is DEF, the bottom row is GHI. These are just all numbers, or they could be functions, or they could be anything, but the key is how you go through them. You start on the top left, and you take A, and then you block out the row and column that A is in. You block out the column under it, which is D and G, and you block out the row, which is B and C. Then you've got a two by two left which is EFHI, and you write the determinant is A times the two by two determinant, EFHI. Then you go to the second um, um, entry on the top row, which is B. And because um, it's the second one rather than the first one, you put a minus sign in front of B. And then you block out the column under B, which is E and H and you block out the row that B is in, which is A and C, and you write a two by two determinant D, I, G, F. And then you go to the next one over, and you take C. And because you, the last one was minus, you put a plus, and then you block out the row and column, and you have the two by two determinant D, H, um, and uh, DE, GH, which is just DH minus GE. You can um, take any determinant, no matter how big, and you can grab the first entry and block out that row and column and say, this determinant of this whole thing is this thing times the determinant of this smaller thing, which is now, if this was five by five, this is now four by four. And then you go across the row, and now you have five four by fours. And then for the four by fours, you go across the row, 
and they collapse into three by threes, and then you go to two by twos, and then you just write this crisscross formula, and you're done. And boy, do you get a mess of terms, which you uh, write out this huge thing of all these things with minus and plus and minus and plus and so on. Um, the determinant itself, just writing them in this array, is such a brilliant, compact way to to do it. You don't have to write out all this stuff. You've got them all right there. Um, it's, it's really very, very slick. Let's um, see how we could use this. Well, um, we can prove with any determinant of any size that if we swap two rows, it changes sign. I won't do that here, but that's um, a fairly straightforward thing to do. And as I said, any size determinant can be decomposed into n size n minus 1 until you get down to the 2 by 2s that you just knock out. Uh, then on this um, slide 516, I'm sorry, it's kind of a little bit small to read. If we've got a closed shell atom with two electron, two n electrons, half of them are spin up, half of them are spin down, and there are n spatial orbitals, uh, an open shell electron has unpaired electrons in different orbitals. Those kinds of systems are, are harder to talk about. But let's now do something like helium or beryllium or neon or something like that that's not, uh, not an open shell atom. That's still quite a few atoms that we can do. That can be written as a single Slater determinant. So as you can probably guess, the other ones that are open shell have to be written as a bunch of Slater determinants, and that just gets more complicated. And what we do then is we take the first spatial orbital and we put it across, uh, 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 we, we take the um, first coordinate and we put it across all the possible spatial orbitals. So we write phi 1 alpha 1, phi 1, beta 1, phi 2, alpha 1, phi 2, beta 1, and so forth. And all the first row refers to coordinate electron 1. And then in the second row, we have everything the same, except now it refers to electron 2. And in the third row, it refers to electron 3. And as we go down the columns, in the, in, the, in the column, it always has the same function coming down and spin state. So column 1 always has function 1 and spin state up. And then you're just referring to the different electrons as you go down. And because you have 2n electrons, it's a 2n by 2n determinant. And the normalization um, which again is an interesting problem to work out, which I won't do here, is 1 divided by the square root of 2n factorial. And that's because of the way you end up with a factorial number of terms in the Slater determinant. The beauty of this thing is that if we swap any two rows, it changes sign. And you can think of swapping rows in two ways. You can think of swapping rows as grabbing row 2 and putting it in 1 and grabbing row 1 and putting it in 2. Or you can think of it just as keep row 1 there but change the 1 to a 2 all the way across and keep row 2 there and change the 2 to a 1. And the latter is just changing the labels that we're using to label the electrons. And Pauli says when you change the labels like that, the wave function has to change sign, and of course the probability, ampl uh, probability density has to remain the same. Practice problem 26 now. Let's write down the sl Slater determinant for the helium atom. Well, there are only two electrons, so our determinant is a 2 by 2. And following our formula on the previous slide, psi 1, 2 is root 2 over 2, straight lines, 1s alpha 1, 1s beta 1, second row, 
1s alpha 2, 1s beta 2, and then we just work out the determinant and we get the exact same thing we had before, 1s1, 1s2 times alpha beta minus beta alpha. You tend to use a shorthand because you tend to um, not want to write out so many things. So if you see alpha beta, uh, something like that, what it means is the first electron is spin alpha and the second electron is spin beta and the person's gotten so sick of writing alpha bracket one that they've got carpal tunnel from doing it and they just write alpha and they expect you to understand that if the alpha is in the first position then it means the first electron. So the ordering is, is what it's all about. And I've used that common shorthand here um, as well. And 1s in this context for helium um, means an optimized 1s orbital uh, with the best value of zeta and not just a simple hydrogen 1s orbital. Okay, we'll uh, stop there and next time what we'll do is we'll actually set up but not solve, but I'll show you um, that there are resources online where you can look these things up for multi-electron atoms that have a lot of electrons, in fact all the way up to xenon even, um, you can go look at the orbitals that have been calculated and boy has a lot of work been put into them. And of course that's a great way to start to build molecules is to have atoms that have optimized orbitals. So we'll leave it there and pick it up next time on these bigger systems.